I didn't set out to be a photographer. Um, a geologist by training in sixth grade. I grew up on Long Island, didn't have a camera, saw the Grand Canyon when I was in sixth grade, and it stuck in my mind. And I owed it all to a, a, an earth science teacher. Instead of taking physics, I took earth science, learned that Long Island was an end marine, and it's like, no wonder why there's no bedrock there, because when you go up north, you get rocks. And it all made sense, but it wasn't until I saw the red rocks of Utah uh, that I became a photographer. But I started out with 4 by 5 back in the film days and um, taught myself composition with 4 by 5 while doing other things. Went to graduate school, ended up studying in the Grand Canyon. And then I got this call. They were looking for a geologist. Uh, Lindblad actually was special expeditions at that time, was desperate for a geologist to talk about Baja, California. And they asked me three questions. Are you comfortable traveling anywhere in the world? And I'd been to Mexico once and Niagara Falls, and so I said yes. <laughs> Are you comfortable talking about the geology anywhere in the world? And I said, well, plate tectonics is a global process, so yes. Can you be in San Diego on February 3rd? And that was an easy one. I said yes. And that was the start. I mean, I'd already been shooting 4x5s. I then downgraded to a medium format, Pentex 645. And this whole thing about our photo expeditions, um, every expedition that we do now because of, well, our alliance with National Geographic and this device, everybody's a photographer. And by the way, Bob, I shoot video. <laughs> it's good to follow the old man in motion. Where is that guy? Oh, uh, he's probably in the bar. Um, so actually, our photo expeditions and our photo program with Lindblad Expeditions and National Geographic predates digital, if you can remember back that far, and the alliance with National Geographic. It was a Zodiac cruise that Sven and I did in 1999, and it was something I'd been thinking about. And um, it says, you know, why don't we market to photographers and have specialty cruises? Because as you know, the fact that you guys are still here, photographers are not normal people, right? <laughs> We're just not normal. So I'm here with great gratitude because I didn't start out to be a photographer. I got into this business kind of through the back door. Um, I'm still here. And the one thing that you can't teach in any of this is passion. And that's why you guys are here. And that's why I think we've been so successful on these expeditions around the world because we have the best platforms. There's just places in the world where you want to go that are best done by ship. And we have these great adventures. We've got the, the Explorer. We've got our, our newer expedition ship, the Orion. These are the most comfortable, best expedition ships afloat. We have these amazing adventures, um, penguins, whales, you name it. We put the ship into the ice. You get out on the ice. You have all these adventures. Um, and I should talk about this one here for a second because we had a polar bear approaching the ship. And I've always wanted to do this, put the camera on a timer with a wide angle lens and try to get the people photographing with the bow of the ship. And then someone goes, oh, the bear stood up. And I'm like, oh my god, I missed it. Really? I had to do it now? And then I was going through later, and it's like, you know, I, I got it. So that was good. Um, so there's those happy, happy uh, serendipitous things that happen. So being on the ship and being in the moment, again, that's the thing about photography is, is that and this actually gets into the psychology of photography. When you are with your camera, you are in the moment. And that's why you're not normal. You are thinking about the light. And these bears, they come up to the side, these polar bears, which are in the north, Arctic. <laughs> they come up to the edge of the ice and they test the ice. They kind of do push-ups. And um, of course, everyone wants the bear to jump. And so this guy comes up, does the push-ups. And, and this is the perfect day, of course. There's no wind perfect patterned ice, and then he just walks across, he or she. But the next time, it jumped. So being in the moment, you're not thinking about anything else. Golf's the same way, but whenever I compare it to golf, everybody wants to quit. So being on these ships, it's, um, you know, we say it's not about the camera. There are situations where it is about the camera. You do need longer lenses. I'm a fan of zoom lenses just because then you can compose. We go out in all kinds of weather. 
Um, we get into situations with Zodiacs, uh, these inflatable boats, um, to go out and have adventures. We, we look for the ice, we look to, to, to look for scenic shots. We're, we're cruising and exploring for composition. I mean, that's really the difference between, well, the difference between a cruise and an expedition is cruises, you know where you're going. Expeditions you're exploring, it depends on the wildlife, it depends on the weather. And so you have to put up with some disappointment, but there's always something great that happens. And the, and the true travelers, and you know this from your own travels, when something happens that changes the course of something, there's usually, if you, you're open to it, something great that's going to happen. You just don't know what it's going to be. Um, kayaking. So you're getting out into these places uh, on these type of trips. And of course, you have a lot of instruction, and we tell you don't get too close to shore because of the bears. <laughs> These folks, they got into all sorts of trouble. You know, they were young, 78 and 80, I believe. <laughs> you can see how she's paddling. She's pushing on the shore to, to back up. They were, they were laughing about it afterwards, but we were. Um, things that happened, humpback whales. Friendly whale in uh, in Antarctica. That's Paul Nicklin, National Geographic photographer, on the on the bow there. Not a good thing to do standing up. This happened this year. This chinstrap penguin. This happened right at the ship, actually, about a mile offshore. Jumps in the Zodiac. Stayed with Adam, driving for 25 minutes. Wouldn't get out. Went for a Zodiac cruise until we brought it ashore and then he had to kind of encourage it because you, you can't touch the wildlife, you can't influence their behavior. They influenced our behavior. Um, dolphins, bow riding dolphins. Um, these guys, these are the offshore bottlenose in Baja, California. Sometimes they'll bow ride with our, our boats for hours. We'll take two different groups. We take turns going out so we don't load the boats overload the boat. So these, these are some of our adventures. Now, I've submitted this and it has not made it in the brochures. <laughs> Baja California, gray whales, they're friendly. They have forgiven us. And this is, this is there's a couple of situations that have, because these trips change lives and, the, and the, our trips have changed my life because 26 years now later I'm still Still doing it, um, and every trip is still exciting. And these gray whales, this is the mother gray whale. It had just done this to our boat, come underneath, and we kind of feel like a whale. It feels kind of like a wet eggplant. And um, it's kind of spongy. And she would come up, and she'd just touch the boat and then kind of lever it up. And so we, I warned them. I said, it's probably going to lift you. Just hold on. I love Missy on the right there with her, oh, my god. And then Michael Nolan there with his staff giving his last rites. <laughs> I must say selfie sticks have been banned in a lot of places now and they are kind of destroying some of our compositions. Um, and the people who travel with us, we, you know, we have our global luminaries, we call them now, and these are explorers, scientists, and this is Peter Hillary. Um, his father was the first to climb Everest. Um, so you just meet great people on these expeditions. Now, for me, it's all about, yes, it is about stories, but it's also about the single picture that kind of says it all. You're looking for that one picture. And if there's one problem with the digital world is we have no longer have any trust for the photos because there have been composites made. In fact, in fact um, Dan mentioned Frank Hurley from the Shackleton Expedition. Um, he was doing composites back then. He changed skies from the expeditions. He cut and pasted a few things from that expedition um, to tell his story. So I wanted to tell the story about these, this, these Adelie penguins who are using this iceberg as a jungle gym. And so a bunch of us, and one thing what I do is usually there's, depend, you know, if there's something good going on, I'm not always in the best spot, but there's usually some people around and so, which is good when the bears come for protection. So we're all there watching this. And it's like, oh my God, they're going to ju start jumping. And one by one, they'd go up there and then jump. And if they didn't do it fast enough, the other guy would encourage him. <laughs> and we all missed it the first couple of times it happened because they don't really say when they're going to fly because they fly underwater. They don't fly through the air. 
And so finally we zeroed in on it and you pre-focus on the ice and then you let them jump through the frame. Another thing I'm famous for is letting things fly out of the frame. You gotta shoot a little looser. You're, in film, your frame was what you had. Now in digital, cropping is not illegal, so you can shoot wider and then crop in how you want instead of letting things go out of the frame, although it is effective to have going in the frame. So of course I was thinking cover here, so I must have already nailed it, so I'm going vertical and then having it jump. And so this is the shot. So it's not photoshopped, although this is the one that gets criticized for that, putting the photo, putting the penguin into the frame. So let's talk a little bit about, oh, so then there are the numbers. There's people who, I mean, we all like the numbers. What camera did you use and what were your numbers? So F8 and B there, 2,000th of a second. 200 ISO, and this is something that has changed. Now with digital, there's a number of things that changed, but certainly your, the ISOs that we use. Now I'm at 640. Uh, it used to be when we first went digital, I was always 100, 200, 400, 800, because that's what film was. Now I like off numbers for some reason. Um, but there'll be times in daylight where I'm shooting at 1600 because I, I want to depth of field and I shoot at f14 and I want a lot of shutter speed because I'm shooting whales. And you can't really tell the difference with some of these high-end cameras from B&H Photo. <laughs> my favorite store. If I had invested the money I put in B&H, I'd be, have my own jet probably by now. So the trips around the world, expeditions around the world, the places that are best for sh to take on expedition ships are to the north, to the Arctic, Svalbard. We're going to talk about Svalbard. We're going to talk about uh, the Canadian Arctic. Baffin Island is a hot spot that we've discovered in the last couple of years for polar bears and the ice there. You'll see that. We'll go over to Alaska, down to Baja, Galapagos, and we'll end up in the south. So first, Arctic Svalbard, north of, of Norway. Um, a very beautiful, beautiful landscape. We call it the land of the ice bears. It, it is, the, the bears there have been protected since the early 70s the walrus as well. The wildlife is coming back. The bears are very well studied. Um, the bears know where the ice is. Um, the geology of it is the, the landscape has been wrenched away from Greenland. So you have mountains on the west, more plateaus. There's places that look like the American Southwest with these broad mesas. Um, the thing about the Arctic is, is the light. We go there in the summer, the sun doesn't set. When you go to the Arctic, you get much farther north, way far north of the Arctic Circle. We're getting up around 80 degrees north. We've been up as high as 82, almost 83, depending on what the ice is doing. When you go in the Antarctic, you bump into that big white continent, and you don't get as far south as we do get north. So that's Bear Island with the ice. So you get the midnight sun, you get some weather systems coming through, and you get the light with the ice, so you basically don't sleep. <laughs> I always wish we could reverse the clock so that midnight's noon. Um, that would get confusing, though. Uh, as beautiful as the light is in this picture, it still pains me because on the other side of the ship is a mother and two cubs walking along the ice edge, and they never came around into the beautiful, the beautiful light. Um, this is probably the polar bear. Now, everything I'm showing you has, is digital except for a, a couple of them, and, and this is one that was original, uh, originally shot on Fujicom Velvia with a 645 camera probably Fujichrome 100, and, uh, or Velvia 100, and um, it was the first bear I'd ever seen, first sequence that I'd ever photographed with a polar bear, and to have a young bear walk up, and it was midnight, so this is the bear in the midnight sun. Um, and so looking in the eye of a polar bear, looking into the eye of a whale, there's something you just don't forget and keeps bringing you back. Um, the Arctic isn't known for its many different species, but the profusion of life there, these harp seals that drifted in on the ice one year, um, the little dove keys, these little auks that uh, mass, it's, I think it's the most common bird in the Arctic. These, they're like little flying footballs. They eat these little co copepods, these little uh, uh, zooplankton in the ocean, and um, they fly around in these great flocks. Uh, where the glaciers are, there's upwellings, and that's where the life is uh, concentrated. Um, you know, the, the whole food chain thing. And we go out and we, and we experience that, and we photograph it, and we, and we revel in it. And, and the thing about these trips, we're back in time for cocktail hour. <laughs> Many times. So it really is a new age of exploration where you can get out and see these things. And it is, I do believe this is true, it's one of the best times in the history of photographic technology to be a photographer, right down to the iPhone. Um, 
There's the, the Svalbard reindeer, a subspecies of the caribou there. Uh, Arctic terns, these are the crazy birds that spend their lives uh, breeding and feeding in the Arctic in the summer and then they fly all the way to the Antarctic, one of the longest migrations, which is the same thing many of our naturalists do. They work in the north and then they work in the south. Bipolar, we call it. <laughs> um, and only photography can yeah, heal you. Um, you know, again, photographs like this, many of the wildlife photographs, the best wildlife photographs, happen where there's repetition. You see it once, you miss it, now you zero in on it, and if you're lucky, uh, it happens again. Um, I think all photographers, have you ever missed a shot you wish you would have gotten? <laughs> you know, that's what haunts us, you know, that's what's, what's, what keeps us coming back. Um, for the birders, the ivory gull, this is like one of the holy grails in the Arctic. The, the ivory gulls live only up in the north, and they follow the polar bears. If we're scoping for polar bears, and we see just little white birds hanging around the ice, we go check that out, because usually it's a bear on a kill. And so we use those cues. One of, another big difference between the Arctic and the Antarctic is that in the Arctic, you have tundra, you have plants. There's only like three plants in the Antarctic, three species. So we've got these great profusion of flowers. And, um, but they're like this tall. So you have to do photography on your belly, which is great about these flip out screens, the articulating screens, because you can put them down and you can see what, see what you're doing. Um, I love when geology comes back into, into my frames, you know, using the calcite veins in the rock here with the purple saxifrage. This is the northernmost flowering species of plant. It's found furthest north than any other plant. And um, now you don't have to show the whole animal to know what it is <laughs> in this case. And, and that's the same thing with people. There's times where you don't want to show the tops of the head. You know, so how you frame really matters. Um, when you're in a good situation, you want to shoot it. You want to work it. And I think that's what separates Again, the normal people from the photographers, we're going to keep shooting, we're going to keep lining it up, you know, we're going to shoot, refocus, shoot, refocus, try to nail it where, you know, Ethel right next to you just goes, click, I got it. <laughs> Where's the polar bear or whatever. Um, so, so work it. You know, it's not, you know, I think there is that misconception that the pros come up and go, click, I've got it. And now we're just, you know, you're going to the bar. No, if anything, we're more worried that we're, we're messing up and that we're missing it or that something, there's something technically going wrong because I don't know about, yeah, everything that could have happened in photography has happened uh, to me at one point or another with, with technology. But this is what it's about in the north is finding that ice bear. And you have to search. They don't just come out and wave and say here, over here. Um, they are curious like most wild animals, um, and so you're looking for a creamy white dot on the ice, all right? And, and that's hard to find. Um, I don't know if Art's still here, but Art Wolf came on a trip with us, I'm thinking it was 2003, 2004. He's such a lucky photographer. Did you see his work? <laughs> the only time ever that we've seen a bear walking across the, the, the ice cap there when was Art was the art was there, because there's nothing to eat for the bear to eat up there. It was just either going from point A to point B, or it was doing it because of the view. <laughs> um, everyone wants to get the jumping bear, so, you know, we spend time. And, th and that's the other thing about expedition travel, is you are always adjusting your, your time, and, and hopefully you do this in your own photography, adjust the meal time, because when's the best time to be eating? Usually it's during sunset. Right, so if you've got normal people with you, you gotta feed them early. That's what you do, right? It is about getting, you know, it, we all want the head and shoulders shots, but this, I can take this same shot in uh, Central Park, right? <laughs> and then it's about 10 frames a second. See, Bob, I should shoot video. <laughs> and then when they do this, you just wanna go give them a big hug. And you can do that once. <laughs> All right. Um, no, you cannot touch the wildlife. 
or influence their behavior, but they influence our behavior all the time. So, so part of my job on these expeditions also is looking for opportunities. And we're, we're sailing, and we have extra time, and we see this iceberg over there. And I've been working with Captain Leif Skog for over 20 years. So now we're in the Northwest Passage. We're going up along Greenland, and we're going to head up to Canadian Arctic and continue north. And uh, Sven needs new, new shots for the, for the brochures. Um, otherwise, don't come home. And we see this iceberg. And I walk up to the bridge, and Leif just goes, want to go over there? And I said, yes. And I said, well, I said, I'm not the expedition leader. We should talk to the expedition leader. I am the captain. <laughs> so he turns the ship. We go over there. We, dro we drop a couple of Zodiacs. Because now we are storytellers, right? We've got to tell the story of the expedition. Every trip that we do as a video chronicler, so we have a videographer. And we drop a Zodiac. We photograph the ship and um, get low to the water and, and, and it was just an amazing, amazing experience. Some pictures now you've seen, this is the first black and white shot I showed you, but it was color in the previous one. This is the, another amazing thing about digital. And this is where I'm sure the black and white artists are probably just cringing because, yes, if you're printing, if you take John Paul's uh, print, uh, Photoshop print class, you will learn the fine art of making uh, prints. But digital has made it very easy to see in black and white, to see color in black and white. And there are shots that just, you know, just scream to be in, in black and white. And it's something you can do in your own, your own work. But it's better to shoot in color. I mean, really, ca most cameras, except for maybe the, the Leica, capture all the information in color, and then you'll have, have all that color information. Um, some storytelling pictures, I am very tuned into um, story, uh, pictures that tell the, the changing climate story. Um, because when my first time in Greenland, especially on the east side, um, it was 65 degrees. We were wearing shorts. And all the ice was just dripping like crazy. I want to show you a short video because we were hoping to make, um, get aerial shots of our ship in 2008 when we were up there and we didn't have good weather. This is when the, the ship was first uh, refurbished and, and on our inaugural voyages. But um, I guess it was a couple years ago I wrote, wrote to New York, and, and, and luckily Sven was there to give permission, and I said, we have an opportunity, we've got good weather, there's a helicopter available, do you want some aerials? And he said, only if it's spectacular, I think was his answer. So in other words, you better get something good, because it was like, I don't know, $1,000, 15 minutes. Um, so we did doors off uh, on, the, on the chopper, and I just want to show you this little video clip that our video chronicler did. Arnie, let's go. All right, my name is uh, Ralph Lee Hopkins, and uh, we're in the Lulisat, Greenland, and we're about to fly over the fjord with one of the fastest and largest calving glaciers in the world. And our mission here, this is a special assignment to photograph the National Geographic Explorer as it's exploring through the ice here this evening with guests on board. And uh, we've got a great pilot, and we're pretty darn excited, so we're ready to go. They're in the ice now. All right, we're coming. That's GoPro footage. This is where chasing ice was flying done. over the ice in Jay Disco Bawa, Bay. Some of his work. Uh, it's an amazing experience. You can see the the giant icebergs here that are grounded. These icebergs take almost a year to get to this point from the Yakoshaven Glacier, the beautiful light coming through the steely gray sky. What we're trying to show is the ship in its true expedition mode, juxtaposed against the ice, peeking out from behind icebergs, in wide channels, and with towering icebergs along its bow. But it's still challenging, even with the doors off. You've got the vibration of the helicopter, so photographically you've got to shoot with a fast shutter speed. Pump my ISO up to 1600, 
typically when you're shooting aerial photos, you're not even worried about depth of field because you're at infinity because you're so high, but our pilot was really skilled, so we would circle the ship. We get very low. <laughs> We're almost throwing prop wash on the bow of the ship. Beautiful. A situation like this, great weather, a great pilot, a helicopter available, and the perfect ice is a rare event anywhere in the world. So that was done, done by Jim Napoli. So that, those are the type of things that we're looking for to tell the story of our expeditions and to uh, get good photos of our expedition platform. Now, last season we tried something that was uh, last summer that I think was very adventurous um, because our captain, Leif Skog, we did a lot of research to see could we make it through the Northwest Passage and not end up, end up like the Franklin Expedition which would have been a bad thing. So we were well stocked with food, full complement of guests, and we had an ice, uh, an, a special ice pilot on from, um, who spent years in the Arctic. So we had an ice captain with our cap Captain Leif Skog. And we also, this was really awesome, we had a Canadian icebreaker there with us, helping us, um, and the helicopter. Which as soon as I saw the helicopters, okay, helicopter, maybe I can get up in the helicopter. It never happened. Um, but it was extremely challenging for two reasons. There was more ice than, even, you know, if you look at all the years, and I remember Leif Skog telling me, yes, it looked, you know, 70% of the time in the last 10 years, you could do it. But if you're there on one of those three years where you couldn't do it because of the ice, and there was wind from the north, and there was a lot of fog. And with the fog, we couldn't scout with the helicopter. Um, so then you can't really pick your path. So we got into some multi-year ice that was very thick. And we were not stuck. We just weren't moving for a little while. <laughs> and the iceberg, or so the icebreaker now, look at this machine, is backing up just to relieve the pressure. Because we could have kept going, but we wouldn't go very fast, and you even see how it pushed us. So it's relieving the pressure because the, the, the wind's blowing, had been blowing, and, and this ice is moving. And, and uh, so this is a time lapse, running at about 24 feet. I just love all the people on, on the mountain. I'm just gonna let it run for a second because now we're gonna get going. We have to get a little running start. <laughs> and then you're gonna see in a second, you're gonna see the icebreaker has no problem and once we get moving, we're fine. And then here comes, where are you? Oh, we're stopping again, probably just for a photo. <laughs> and there goes the icebreaker. <laughs> so um, so there, that was quite an adventure, and there's more to it than just, just that. But it, boy, was it fun. And, and even though we weren't successful, Almost everyone on the chip said that was the best expedition that they'd ever done because of the uncertainty. Fog bows. Has anyone seen a fog bow? With a, with a, this is another situation where a fisheye, the only way to get, a, get the uh, clearing fog here was a fisheye. And so up in the Canadian Arctic also there are great, great concentration of bears. Wherever you find the ice, you find bears. That's where the food is, that's where the platform is. And if it's a young bear, typically they, they come and check us out. And uh, what was it, two years ago, Sven, where we had two consecutive trips. We saw 61 bears in a matter of days up in this one area. So it's a hot spot. Um, photographing, I'm, again, I'm a big fan of, of the zoom lenses. I'm, I shoot Canon. My name's Ralph. I shoot Aperture Priority. And, um, and when they come up, because I like, when you're on a fixed platform, so, so be able to change your, your compositions with zooms. And then this was a, a very rare situation, because usually when you see a swimming bear, you don't, you don't pursue a swimming bear because you could stress it out. I mean, bears can swim a long way, but they're usually going from point A to point B. But this young guy swam towards us. And we radioed from the top. We said, hey, it looks like this bear is curious. So we stopped the ship dead in the water, and it came over and checked each one of them, just looking at us. So everyone had a moment um, with this bear. And then it jumped around and rolled in the ice and then went about its business. The light, again, the light in the Arctic. Um, this is heading up along Ellesmere Island. 
Um, we discovered some really beautiful places up there where, where Greenland kind of constricts against uh, the Canadian Arctic there. So now we have uh, longer trips. We're making a few longer trips this summer and next summer to explore that area because the light up there is just spectacular. And there was this one, I, I swear they spiked the water at dinner. The reflections, usually in the Arctic, I mean, this is some of the windiest, stormiest places, you know, on the planet. And we have this perfect glass and with the way the ship was going through, through the water just made these beautiful, beautiful patterns that we just couldn't shoot enough of. Um, but again, up, up north, it's about the midnight sun. It's about the wildflowers on the tundra. And then we do get weather. The last, I mean, yeah, I do love, I do love sunny weather, and I live in New Mexico, but cloudy, over, overcast days for nature photography is probably my, my favorite light. Um, and uh, and, and we, you do get some inclement weather, and then you, then you shoot the raindrops, you know. There's no sense getting frustrated. Light is what it is, and then you, you see what your situation is, and you use it. Um, you look for framing devices, framing flowers through, in this case, whale bones. And then we were discovering, um, this is a harpoon. This is an old, and so this is an artifact. Um, so there's a lot of uh, walrus hunting sites, whale hunting sites up there in the Canadian Arctic as people. That's another difference between Svalbard. Over in Svalbard, there weren't Inuit, there weren't, um, native cultures up there, indigenous cultures, but when you go, get over to the Canadian Arctic, um, the, poor, the poor Franklin expedition, we go to some of the historic sites when you get up there, some of the graves. You know, if you were to take the time to read this one, it's a 20-year-old man who lost his life, and we all know that they all vanished up there. Um, and then there is the modern-day Inuit. And um, so visiting these folks and seeing their embracing of technology now so it's, it's very interesting, and it's very educational, and it's very humbling. And I always feel guilty after traveling to these places and going back into a Whole Foods. You know, and it's like, and someone's upset because they don't have their flavor of yogurt. And it's like, have you ever had to kill a seal? Um, but the light in the north, and this is why it's hard to sleep. We become insomniacs. Um, and then there's, does anyone believe in the green flash? Oh, I went too fast on that one. The green, the blue, and the violet. So you get some weird optical phenomena up there and, and the way that light refracts over, over and it's something, there's kind of a cult of people every night you go and every morning you look for the green flash where, where the atmosphere reflects the light. Roy G. Biz spreading it, in, spreading it into the rainbow colors and it can be photographed. Um, so it is magical, this is later in the season. Um, when you start do getting twilight, and then let, and then this was over the top, the end of last season when we had the northern lights. On a perfect night, it was so calm, the ship was moving so slowly, you could set your tripod up and, and shoot like a minute exposure with just only a little bit of motion. So that's the Arctic. Oh, now over in Alaska, and I just came back from New Zealand, and everyone raves about the glaciers in New Zealand. But if you want to see the most beautiful glaciers, you go to southeast Alaska. Those beautiful glaciers, uh, in the world, but you should see them all. <laughs> you should go north, you should go south, Chilean fjords, but go to Alaska to the, one of the tallest coast ranges, the Fairweather Range up there around Glacier Bay. Um, it's called the Fairweather Range. Well, it's misnamed, but um, you don't want sunshine anyway, and if you're in a rainforest, you'd love to have a little rain and mist, but the ice up in this part of the world, the fast-moving glaciers that are calving now, um, getting out amongst the ice with zodiacs. And the ice is actually bluer on a cloudy day because of the whole physics of the way the atmosphere cuts out the warm wavelengths. Um, and it's just unreal. It's like these the icebergs are lit from within. And uh, ice is kind of an addiction for me now. I can't, because every, every iceberg is a unique piece of art that will never be repeated. Uh, misty weather. I love misty weather. I don't want a pouring rain where everything's getting wet, but having mist and getting into the forest with the giant trees and the devil's club. Um, the, you know, if you go early in the season in Alaska, you're there in, uh, and you're seeing the wildflowers. Go later, you're getting the berries. Um, of course, there's history there. There's fishing towns. There's the, the, the Haida history, the, the Clinkett history, the Russian history. 
Uh, and even the modern day, I mean, Southeast Alaska and Alaska has the best managed fisheries in the world for halibut and salmon. And the sea lions know it, stellar sea lions, and the bears know it. And there's one place in the world that I know of that where we go that where we can whale watch and see whales feeding in the, in the morning and then go into a cove and see bears feeding in the afternoon. And that's in Chatham Strait. And so you have these bears feeding, and, and that's, this is where the shot was of the folks that got too close. <laughs> but the bear doesn't care because she's there just for um, the salmon. We're not food to her. Until, <laughs> and this is why, this is when you get around your naturalist, your photo leader, until she sees that her cubs just came out on the shore behind you. So she's now coming. If you see a bear coming like this at you, that's when you, so did you ever, you know those cartoons where everyone moves at once? <laughs> Twelve people got in the zodiac and got away. Um, so there's rainbows, and then there's rain blows. So this is the blow of a humpback whale with the, the light streaming through. So these humpbacks, has anyone been to Maui? These are the, when the whales are there, the same whales that are down there feeding, excuse me, are down there mating and competing for females and beating, beating each other up over the females trying to, to mate, are up here cooperatively feeding in the summer. They, they recognize the same whales that do it year after year. And there's one lead whale that goes down and blows bubbles out of its blowhole. They rise in a column and then they all come up. It's called bubble net feeding. And there's one whale that blows the trumpet or trumpets and goes when it's time for them all to come up. So it's a cooperative action. And it's beautiful and they do it over and over and over again. Killer whales, the orca up there and then down into it. So we have trips even that go down to Seattle. You know, we do the whole inside passage. And, and the killer whales are where you find them. There are areas where they congregate. Just ignore David. <laughs> Stellar sea lions. And again, it's about the, you know, when you're out there, it's about, it had been raining. It had been a you know, horrible rainy day. And sooner or later, you want to see some different light. And it came out, and then you can see all the, the, the sea lions now. These stellar sea lions are steaming. This is in Glacier Bay because the, the sun's just coming out on them, creating an effect. Cute little otters. From, this is a shot from Zodiac. So every one of these pictures I'm showing you are from one of these expeditions, either from the ship or, or a Zodiac. There are wolves. Um, rarely seen, but they're there. So you can travel on these expeditions this way, or if you prefer. <laughs> it's a choice. Yeah, so that was, it was in Glacier Bay, you know, we're floating in the glacier and you turn around and there's like the, you know, the, the mega dam or whatever, the, the huge, huge ship it's called. And um, everyone's watching from their balcony. And then, we, and then the next day we're out in our ki kayaks amongst the ice. It's a very different mode of travel. And of course in, the, in Alaska there's the, you know, the, the modern day and, and the history of the cultures. And, and their way of life, and, and, and we see that. And, they're, they're, and, the, and the inspiring thing is that with these indigenous cultures is there is a movement, and, you know, Art Wolf was talking about the good, there is a lot of, there is good news. You know, there, the, the cultures are, there are people trying to keep these cultures alive, even though, you know, if you look at statistics of language, how fast things are disappearing and changing. So teaching the kids the dances. And so we, we go here twice a year, both of our ships go here twice a year. This is a seabird and a sea lion. And, and witness this. Um, I should say something about this shot because this was taken in about, shot was made in 2003 with the state of the art first Canon digital SLR. It was the D30, three megapixels. Couldn't shoot it, but some of the photos stand up just because you didn't shoot over 50 or 100 ISO. So anyway, that's the, all right, so one of my, I'm always asked what, you know, what, what are, what's the best place to go, what's, what's your favorite place, um, and I'd say all of these are, um, but, and they're all unique, you can't compare them, there is one Galapagos, you know, end of story, um, 
You know, the animals, they're there. You have to step over them. You have to step around them. The sea lions run the place. The Galapagos sea lions run the place. Um, they're volcanic. They're new islands. There's um, you know, breaking waves. There's endemic species. Sally Lightfoot crabs. Okay, using slow shutter speeds, right? Um, and I love using shooting blurry on purpose. You know, a shot like this, I probably um, took 150 shots over 30 minutes because sometimes the crabs move. Sometimes the water hasn't filled in. You know, it's probably a one second exposure, something like that, to blur it. If you see an, me take another cute picture of a sea lion, just shoot me. But I can't resist. I will take it every time because they're just, they're just too cute. Albatross, the waved albatross there. Um, you know, it's just one of those, those things. You just, there's very few places where you can just walk up and see birds at close range, blue-footed boobies. Over and over, they, they'll do these flights or these dances coming back. So, you know, this is probably like not that good. So it's like probably the fifth time that I saw it. Did I, did I nail it? Um, great frig frigate birds, or yeah, these are the great frigate birds. Look at the eye ring on this swallowtail gull. So just amazing, amazing critters. The vermilion flycatcher up in the forest. So it's kind of rain foresty up on the top of the islands, the top of the volcanoes. It can be almost desert. And then I'm always looking out for opportunities to put people in images, and these little girls were just, I love other people's kids. Problem is now, I, you know, I didn't want children, but I want grandchildren. <laughs> this is flawed thinking. But so they, I just said, well, just sit here. I think it's coming. I think it's coming. It's going to check you out. You got to shoot a really fast shutter speed to freeze the action. No, it's not. <laughs> it's really. Going through the rainforest, through the brush. And then another shot. This is, this is a, a black and white conversion. Uh, making it look infrared, so the greens go white. So that's kind of fun to play around with at times. And then the crazy marine iguanas, the only marine iguanas in the world that, that uh, iguanas that go into the ocean, they swim. Darwin did some experiments to see how long they could stay underwater by tying a rock and a rope to them and dropping them. Then go back later and see if they were alive. So I still haven't perfected this shot work because they always move, uh, but that's okay. You know. It's not about perfection, it's about showing, showing the art and design of it. And for some reason, we're all just fascinated with their sneeze because they're marine creatures and they expel the salt through their nostrils. And colleagues of mine, they've set up time, you know, every, every second they'll take a picture, they'll do it like a time lapse trying to get the sneeze. But when you're really good, no, uh, it took me a lot of shots too for this one. <laughs> and nice light, the Christmas iguanas that turn color in December. And so the reason Galapagos, the animals are so friendly is there's no predators. That's what we're told. The herons eat the marine iguanas, the owls eat the, some of the other birds, um, the gulls eat the crabs. There's something else going on there. I don't know, there's some kind of magic out there because the food chain still does exist. And if you go, you know, many of the places you go in the world, got to have a camera that can shoot underwater, um, some kind of underwater housing, or, um, or even these ones that are all weather, just take them under with you. The poor, poor uh, flightless cormorant, there's only like 2,000 of them left there. They're stranded there. They no longer can fly. So they dry their wings. They feed. They're, they're, but they're in paradise. They, they don't have to go anywhere. Now, Baja, California now. I'm going to switch now to someplace closer, uh, someplace you can get to very easily. It's less than a two hour flight from the States. It's the best place in the world to see whales and dolphins, um, bar none. And if you're not seeing the whales, you're seeing the dolphins. And it's, it's due to the geology that all this is there because Baja Peninsula, which is about as long as Florida, is being pulled off, wrenched off of North America, creating a deep ocean basin, submarine volcanoes, um, happening today, you know, marine basins 10,000 feet deep, and with the upwelling, the whales and the fish, it's, it's Mexico's richest fishery. And there's this string of islands with more endemic species of plants and animals than Galapagos. Not as famous because Darwin didn't go there, 
um, but just as, as amazing. Uh, you got these crazy Bujum trees. You've got the um, spiny-tailed iguanas. Now, for years, we always went early in the morning to see the birds. The wildlife is most active early in the morning. So we go shore at sunrise. We'd be gone by 9 o'clock. And we had no idea that at 10.05 every morning, <laughs> these guys climb the Cardone cacti, which are also endemic in that area, and they feed on the blossoms that bloomed the night before. And so it becomes this great search. There's also on one of the islands, and we never would see them in the past, on this the Santa Catalina, the rattlest rattlesnake. You know they're there because you don't hear them, right? <laughs> We didn't see them because they were feral cats that were left behind by fishermen. And once, uh, when we have these, one of the other brilliant things that uh, Stan and our team has done is we've developed these conservation programs now that National Geographic is working with us as well. And, and we've raised a lot of money and supported a lot of conservation initiatives, removed the cats, the snakes. Now almost every trip we'll see a rattless rattlesnake there. Feeding time, the lovebirds, the Hearman's gulls. So there's one another success story is this island that had um, rats. And it was in the guano trade. And these birds were decimated. Their nesting areas decimated. Elegant terns and Hearman's gulls on Isla Rasa in the northern part of the gulf. The birds are now back in great profusion. And there's been researchers there working, Mexican researchers from the universities, Enriqueta Velarde, that we've supported also probably for over two decades that have been working there for more than 30 years to bring these birds back. Now, if you go to San Diego, you'll see Hearman's gulls and, and elegant terns. So great, great profusion of life there in the upper gulf, taking advantage of all this upwelling and the food chain there. And every island has a pair of peregrine falcons feeding on the birds. I almost fell out of the zodiac with this shot. Shot with a 300 prime, f2.8, which I no longer have. Now that we have the new 100 to 400, that new cannon zoom is out. Whales, the blue whales. Um, now things change. In the last season or two, the blue whales have been sparse. The Sea of Cortez is warm. It's warmer now maybe than in, in recorded history. The food source is changing. The whales may be in the, in the north. So the, the blue whale is the largest whale on the planet. The fin whale, maybe the largest mammal ever, or animal ever on the planet, larger than the dinosaurs. The fin whale with its white lip. Uh, humpback whales also come there. So there's sperm whales, there's pilot whales, and there's the gray whale. You saw that one shot, but the, when we go to the lagoons on the Pacific coast, these are the whales that have forgiven us from almost wiping them off the planet. They want to be touched. Most places in the world, you don't touch the wildlife. If we don't touch the whales there, they'll just go over there and ask to be touched. The mothers push them up, as, as you saw. They come close. They, you know, it's just like, how cute am I? I've never, this, this is a shot from this year, and I've never seen that. That is that little whale's fluke. It almost looks like the little rubber toy that you have in your tub. So the gray whales, you know, and looking into the eye of the whale is just, again, it's, a, it's one of those things that you just don't forget. And the dolphin's under perfect situations, you know, no you know, polarizing filter, um, crank the ISO, or Shoot it, shoot it blurry. And again, you have to shoot a lot of shots like this. You take a lot of bad shots. So some, when you're panning at a 15th of a second, sometimes it just works. So is it blurry or is it artistically blurred? <laughs> and then the leaping crazy dolphins, and you're going to think, oh, it's, fo you know, again, in Photoshop, again, this was this season, and these guys were just going off. But I shoot video. iPhone. <laughs> I mean, that's like 25 feet out of the air. And then when I was hanging off the bow, and all that was going on in the back, I missed when they were first jumping um, in that situation. And then this guy had my wide angle on, just came up and, and took a look. And this is where, you know, having, being, always, you know, when you're a wildlife photographer, always on motor drive. Well, we, what do we call it now? Burst mode. All right, and I'm always on continuous focus, but a back button focus. Um, I'll be talking about some of these techniques tomorrow. 
You've got to be ready for action. You're always ready for a landscape or a pretty sunset, right? You can always change everything, but when things happen, and I hate lens caps. When you get to the destination, just lose your lens cap and then put it on when you leave because there's more great pictures. <sighs> and again, underwater. And these crazy mobula rays that two times in my 25 years down there has this happened and this just happened two weeks ago um, where they were b cruising. It was perfect situation, cruising with the ship and then just one of the shots, and I had no idea I had this. I'm shooting F-11 where the sun hit the wing of the mobula. So you just... It's all luck. But you got to be there and click the shutter. Painting with light. This is another thing that's changed with digital, right? That you can paint with light and see what you're doing. 30 second exposures. We even had the captain in this case. He just loved this when I called Captain Coughlin. I called Captain, Captain, and he goes, What do you want? Usually it's like moving the ship. I said, Can you shine the light for five seconds on that rock and then shine it towards us? And we had to do it over. Can you do it one more time? <laughs> All right, so, so we'll wind up down south, going to Antarctica. Um, I get seasick if it's rough, but um, there are drugs for that where I lay down. Probably shouldn't show this shot. <laughs> the way I combat it is, is, is I eat right, um, take the pills, and then if I can, I just get out on deck. There's a spot where you can stay just behind on the stern. And when it's like this, I just consider it a weight loss cruise. <laughs> and then photograph the, the albatross and the birds. And so when you concentrate on something and you're looking at the horizon, it's no problem. It's when you go in and try to download or think about food. But this is the Drake Passage. Right here, glassy. Uh, Pintado petrel dragging its wing in the water. Oh, it's been like that once. Uh, whales. When we go down there, uh, there's humpback whales in the south. The thing about these, I think Art said it, it's true. Galapagos Islands are in better shape than they were 100 years ago because a lot of the uh, introduced species have been removed because of the conservation initiatives and the change in you know, we're not whaling and doing all those things and egging, and the whales are coming back very slowly, but um, just in my career, the whales have gotten more plentiful just in the last you know, 20, 25 years. And sometimes we're too close, but the whales decide, right? And this is, this is another once in, 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 a, in a career situation where we were out in the Zodiacs and the, and the, the killer whales down there hunt cooperatively and they make these waves. You've probably seen these videos or on Frozen Planet, BBC work, where they make the waves and wash the, the seal. This is a leopard seal. It's not the whale's favorite. They're, the wet owl seal, the plumper seal is their favorite. But they come and they spy hot and they're looking for seals. They actually checked out our zodiacs as well. And we followed them for about 20, 25 minutes. They made one attempt and then they, and then they moved on because they were looking for, they, they know how to identify what their food. But they'll eat anything. They, they really will. And then getting out in the kayaks in this this type of environment. Because the Antarctic, it's just, there's just nothing like it. Uh, the scale of the ice. Everyone goes for the penguins the first time. Everyone goes back for the ice because it's just that amazing. And the light and the adventure. We had to throw this guy five times before he stuck. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. But the chin straps, they're very feisty. Each, each species of penguin has its own personality. Um, if you go in, in January when the chicks are born and, and they're just, just cute, it doesn't even smell that bad. <laughs> you get used to it. It's the ship. S curves, you know, looking for patterns, walking across the ice. A very thoughtful wet L seal. And then South Georgia. Now, you can go to Antarctica, and it's a great trip. We do it over and over and over again. We've got two ships now, Lindblad National Geographic, um, going down there. Um, but there are these sub Antarcticons, and there's the place called the Falklands as well, with all these birds and wildlife. But South Georgia, the island of South Georgia, is like going to the Serengeti of the Antarctic. Great light, 
And this is one of those mornings, early digital, um, where we went ashore at sunrise, and those who chose to come ashore, every one of us. Terry, were you on this trip? I filled up every memory card before breakfast. But now there's 128 gigabyte memory cards from B&H. <laughs> King penguins. There's Abe from San Diego. So it's good to have scale. 250,000 penguins on this one beach. And this one time, it was really windy. And the penguin up in the upper right hand corner got blown over, knocked all the other ones over like dominoes. <laughs> I, I want to I make a, a, an animation. We have the technology for that now, don't we? So looking for the odd man out, you know, the adult going through the, the oak and boy chicks. You know, it's like, who is lined up photographing who here? No, looking for patterns. Everyone was disappointed when the sunrise didn't happen and then it started snowing. You know, the beauty of seeing fresh snow down there. The elephant seals might have been too, cl too close on this one because if they fall over, I and mean, this is like a, a Hummer landing on you. <laughs> and the albatross down there in the south, the gray-headed, and then the wandering albatross um, with, with a rainbow. And I was really lucky to get this shot. No, actually, these guys will do it over and over, their, um, their display, their sky pointing, but that rainbow was there for four hours. Believe it or not, there was a hole in the cloud, and it just hung there. I should probably say I, can. I shouldn't say that, how, that's a rare event. <laughs> no, it is a rare event. And then um, it's now the centennial for the Shackleton expedition. You all remember that story about the ship getting stuck in the ice and that got crushed and, and the boss let everyone, got, all his men made it back and then he made this boat journey to South Georgia. Well, they were in the ice, living on the ice after their ship had sank. Hurley, they could only take 100 photos with them. Hurley had three rolls of film. He didn't take his big camera. That all went down. Um, so we had three rolls of film with him at that point. And the place where they first came ashore was Elephant Island. And for the first time in my career, the weather was where we could just drive a Zodiac in exactly in the same spot and land in the same spot 100 years later, almost exactly 100 years later, which it gave us all goosebumps and then uh, making the black and white conversion. So there we are, the explorers. And we went back to hot showers, soup, and our beds were made. <laughs> so that's adventure in this day and age. Thank you very much. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, B&H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.